brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum and welcome again to this weekly webinar with me, the moderator, Sayyid Mahdi Abidi. As you know, the topic of this webinar is Islam and contemporary issues, and it is a topic that will be discussed uh, every Monday at 6 p.m. UK time, inshallah. Uh, as you know, the layout is going to be uh, our dear guests who will be joining us, inshallah, will have different sorts of guests across these uh, weekly webinars, uh, ranging from uh, learned individuals to scholars, uh, doctors and professors. Uh, and of, as you know, inshallah, uh, today, alhamdulillah, we are very blessed to have Hujjat al-Islam al-Muslimin, uh, Sheikh Hussein Latifi, who is joining us from Iran. Just before I introduce him, uh, a quick biography, inshallah. Sheikh Hussein Latifi was born and raised in Qum uh, after 10 years of study in the Islamic seminary or Hausa of Qum and uh, simultaneous with following advanced Islamic jurisprudence and its uh, principles. Uh, at the Kharij level, he continued parallel postgraduate studies in the universities of Tehran and earned an MPhil in 2014 and a PhD in 2018 in Western philosophy. In Hausa, he benefited from Antullah Sayyid Ahmed Madadi, Sheikh Mahdi uh, Shabzan Dadar, and J uh, Sayyid Javad Shubairi Zanjani. In university and Hausa, he has taught under and postgraduate. Uh, courses on Islamic theology, history, philosophy, and jurisprudence in Arabic, Farsi, and also in English. Uh, in his home country and abroad, uh, from August 2019 to April 2022, he has served as the visiting lecturer of Islamic studies at the University of Zimbabwe and Arupa Jasui University. Uh, as you know, inshallah, the layout is going to be our dear guest speaking for about 45 to 50 minutes near the end. I highly encourage you. Uh, the viewers to join and participate in our question and answer session in which you the viewers can send in your questions uh, whether it's on youtube whether it's here on zoom or anywhere where you're watching i'll be monitoring all platforms inshallah and ready uh but so make sure you have your questions ready inshallah for our dear guests to answer sheikh salam alaikum and thank you so much for joining me today thanks for having me Inshallah, whenever you're ready, if you can introduce the subtopic that you're going to be talking about, and Inshallah, we can begin today's webinar. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Anbiya wa al-Mursaleen Muhammadan wa ala tayyibin al-Tahirin. First, allow me to express my condolences over the, uh, the tragedy of Karbala and the, the occasion of Muharram, and today is the first of Safar. Uh, all the believers, mu'mineen, who are... Uh, expressing their sympathy with the progeny of the Prophet uh, for that tragedy. Uh, let me express my condolences to them and let us join uh, this caravan of sorrow uh, from Karbala to uh, Sham, the Levant. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place us among the true followers of Ahlul Bayt <coughs> and true believers as the Prophet is a Sahih hadith from the Prophet that he said, in the Laqatul al Hussain, uh, surely for the killing of Hussain, there is a warmth, hararatan, in the hearts of believers. Lantabrud uh, Abada, and it will not be put off, uh, never. It will be put off. So, uh, this, if you have those who have this uh, warmth in their heart and they feel that sympathy and sorrow for this occasion, uh, let them receive my condolences. Uh, so, yes, we were talking about uh, contemporary issues and Islam and morality, religion and morality in general. So previous session, we mainly talked about some of the uh, theoretical aspects of the discussion. Uh, to, to begin our discussion, inshallah, uh, we, we had to consider different aspects of what we mean by uh, secular morality or rational morality and then religious or faith-based morality and different ways that this combination or this contrast could be understood in different traditions uh, like biblical tradition or judeo-christian tradition and islamic tradition the differences that are there uh, the, the, we, we ended up talking about the concept of covenant also existing in islam and how that affects the, the moral values. Uh, so at the, towards the end of the previous session, we had a good practical question about uh, what's the practical solution for having and achieving moral virtues. 
And I gave, I, 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 as I remember, I had given a very short answer to that, but inshallah in this session, we're gonna arrive at that position when we talk about the practical tips that we need uh, in order to have those moral virtues established in our personalities, inshallah. Uh, but before that, we still have some of the uh, theoretical aspects, uh, especially in the Islamic tradition now. Um, if the uh, dear moderator can allow me to share the screen, uh, and I can show the dear viewers the slides that would be better. Otherwise, I can go through them as well. So when we want to trace the, <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> when we want to trace the, okay, yes, I have it now here. The teachings about morality in Islamic tradition, traditionally uh, Muslim scholars, they have classified uh, these teachings in, I mean, Islamic teachings in general. Uh, one is to trace that in this triple classical division of Islamic teachings, which is, uh, they say that Islam, okay, is either the teachings that you find in Quran and in Hadith or either the belief, uh, there are things concerning what you have to believe to be uh, considered a Muslim, or the laws or practical uh, rituals that you have to follow or moral teachings. So we see uh, moral teachings are as important as the belief and laws. So uh, they, they are regarded as the main part. I mean, one of the main three parts of the teachings of the religion of Islam. In another uh, occasion or position that we can find moral teaching is in Kalam or Islamic theology. Uh, when Mutakallimun, Muslim theologians, when they discuss about attributes of justice, when they, they talk about attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one attribute is the attribute of justice, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, and there is a tremendous amount of discussions, debates going on. We have Adliya, Shia and Mu'tazila, they believe in the just divine justice, but uh, then we have other groups who don't believe in the rational criterion for understanding uh, divine justice. In that position, uh, they talk about the criterion with which we can pass moral judgments. Are we capable of passing moral judgments or not? And if we are capable, what enables us to do that? So mainly, al-husn al al aqliyan evil and good are discerned through human faculty of reason. That is what uh, we as Shia believe. And it has some ramification it has some uh, uh, effects in the way we understand uh, the, the, our moral behavior or try to rectify the moral behavior or judge in moral situations so uh, then on the other camp we have people who believe that it's only revelational meaning that uh, we don't have that criteria to pass these judgments uh, and it has its own again uh, consequences and follow-up uh, results. In the principle of jurisprudence, again, we have al-mustaqillat <coughs> al-aqliya wa ghayr al-mustaqillat al mulazama There is a principle of the, uh, let's say, the association or uh, the necessary religious rule based on the rational rule. If there is some rule that is the rule of reason and not just one reason or in one particular situation. No, for example, that injustice or oppression is abhorrible, it is bad. This is the rule of reason. Then uh, religion also will issue a, hook, a rule in accordance with that. So this Qadatul uh, Mulazama, that reason and religion they both agree in the certainties, in the areas that uh, it's not a matter of different cases, it's not a matter of uh, different moral dilemmas. Most people, they try to appeal to moral dilemmas to, to, to make it seem that morality is relative. Uh, when, uh, in fact, when we consider those cases, we realize it's a moral conflict between different things uh, like 
uh, it's a situation of a conflict between a better decision or a bad decision and then uh, the greater good or the lesser evil all of the situations that uh, in in some arguments they try to put forth uh, it is discussed in the principles of jurisprudence in the section that they call tazahum tazahum means conflict so we are not talking about in the section of tazahum because that section has its own rules in, in moral judgments in moral decisions when it comes to conflicts like you want to to make your mind to to make a decision in a situation where there are different parties involved and you 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 have to sometimes harm uh, i mean there is no other way to get through this situation uh, unless one party gets harmed and how uh, you can deal with this situation so this is tazahum moral conflict but by no means this means morality is relative this is not the relativity of morality this means the flexibility of human rational faculty in understanding complicated moral situations and that is why we are still capable of passing moral judgment and those people who see that situation sometimes uh, maybe i see a situation i don't know all the details or all the exact details of that situation and then i blame an agent who is involved in the situation but once i get inside and i see that different sides of it then i appreciate and i praise the person because of the decision that he or she made so uh, in the principles of jurisprudence they discuss this and there you can find discussions related to morality in the fiqh and jurisprudence itself, as we know, there are two sciences. One is <clears throat> fiqh and jurisprudence. The other is the principles of jurisprudence. So the relationship between the two uh, is almost like the re relationship between philosophy and logic. As logic is the tool that people use in philosophy, and uh, a special philosophical system, they have their own logic. Uh, it, it is true uh, about principles of jurisprudence, which functions as the logic for jurisprudence and there are different schools uh, within Shia and within Sunni Islam and uh, they have their own principles which they apply in the jurisprudential system or structure that they have in the <coughs> if we want to trace the discussions about morality in uh, jurisprudence then there is the section of uh, nas, the rights of people in contrast to the rights of God so among the obligations that every Muslim has is uh, observing the rights of people, and there are special laws concerning, there are special divisions, like is either <clears throat> uh, financial uh, or like it, 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 in terms of the positions and the properties that they have. This is one of them. The second is the, the physical uh, rights that they have, meaning that the, their body, for example, if uh, a person harms another person physically, like in a fight or something like that, uh, how he should compensate for that. And then earth, earth means the reputation and the social status of a person. If I attack a person, uh, not his body, not his property, but his social status, like, like backbiting, like uh, insulting, uh, like <clears throat> trying to ruin his reputation, for example, and how you can compensate. And there's a special case for tawbah, like uh, tawbah in hukuk nas repentance in hukuk nas in the rights of people is not as easy as uh, the rights of God. The rights of God are the individual things that are between you and God, like fasting, prayer, the acts of worship that are there, or uh, certain sins that they don't have social ramification things that you do and which harms yourself that is something else in fact it's haqq on nafs uh, because nobody can do injustice to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they say haqq allah and they say the right of god they mean it's actually harming us myself only so repentance in this uh, case is much easier than the repentance in the case of nas, which needs compensation making up for the loss that you created, either financial loss or, uh, as they said, the social reputa reputation that you ruin for a person. Uh, another division for Hukun Nas is that mental. Uh, we have a hadith, not one hadith, several hadith that says, 
if you try to scare a mu'min, a believer, sometimes scare a person, and then you scare him or her, and if you give him dunya in, in, uh, in, for compensation, for, for making up for it, it will not be enough. If you give him the whole world after one, it will not be enough for just that moment that he was scared. Uh, something that sometimes people joke about these things like for example we open the door and they, they scare the person off so maybe you say it's not a financial loss it's not a physical loss it's not a reputation it's only something sometimes it's a matter of reputation because you do it in front of others and the person feels very bad embarrassed in, in front of others but sometimes no it's alone so i'm not embarrassing anyone it's only me and him for example we're joking but you scared him seriously and the hadith says you're actually uh, uh, mentally uh, attacking him. You're doing something to his soul that you cannot compensate. So uh, we have these four <clears throat> in Hukuk nas and the discussions are there. If istihlal is necessary, istihlal means uh, asking for forgiveness in addition to the compensation uh, that you have to make. Or for example, if you, if you made a loss in that reputation, you have to go and tell those people that I made a mistake, it was not like what I said, or sometimes it's even worse that you cannot, you cannot just contain it. Because once you say something, especially in the age of social media, once you say something, you just destroy the person for, for the rest of his or her life. And uh, no matter how much you try, you cannot make it up. You cannot just reverse it. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And it is discussed in uh, in philosophy, the discussions related to, to uh, moral <coughs> morality in religion, in Islamic philosophy, when they discuss about different types of human reason, practical reason versus theoretical reason, this division was started by Aristotle in his book, The Animal, and he discussed it. And later on, Muslim philosophers, they uh, adopted this idea. And uh, they developed it so far uh, as if uh, they, they, they contributed so much original contribution to the discussion. And it was a basis in Islamic philosophy that human reason, there are two parts of human reason that uh, one is uh, practical reason and one is theoretical reason. As you know, in Islam, I mean, in Arabic language and also in the hadith that we have, aql, intellect is not contrasted with jah. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Jahl is not contrasted always with uh, ilm. Jahl means in ignorance. So the opposite of ignorance, Jahl is what? Is uh, knowledge. Once it's, it is one division that exists, that is there. Ignorance and knowledge to con contrast. Another contrast is between uh, intellect and Jahl. And Jahl here is not... Uh, lack of knowledge. Jahl here is that lack of intellect. What does it mean? The weakness of practical reason. We say that the person is jahl, not in the sense that he does not know this, in the sense that he does not have the ability to make the right decision in the right situation, or to he does not have the willpower does not have jasm. Jasm means determination to do something. Like a person who is, may Allah forbid, addicted to something, who is caught up at the middle of a wrong, bad habit, and he cannot break it. Uh, he knows that it is wrong. Like, for example, a person is smoking, and he knows that smoking is wrong. It's harming his body, but he cannot stop. So we say this is jahl. Jahl in the sense of lack of knowledge, no, jahl in the sense of doing something, uh, that a person who does not apply his intellect does. So in that discussion, in philosophy, they discuss different cases of these, uh, the roots of moral vices, inshallah, at the end of the uh, tonight's presentation, if we get time, we should talk about this. What moral vices are rooted in lack of knowledge, in ignorance? What moral vices are rooted in uh, lack of determination, not lack of knowledge. The person knows perfectly everything. Maybe I'm a teacher of morality and ethics, but I have issues. That, that This is 
happening on daily basis that people who actually are very well versed in ethics and morality but they have serious practical shortcomings and what's the root of that so they discuss it there and in a spiritual wafering that we say like a suluk uh something i, I didn't use the word sufi here because uh it's not sufi because sufis also they have this but it's not only for them so i i put the title a spiritual wafering because this exists also out of the circles of sufis uh, among like uh the camp of fuqaha that they are against sufism but they have this spiritual training some of them uh it, it's like <coughs> a practice that needs the certification from the previous teacher and they train souls uh, their student spiritually and uh, different vices uh, they try to eliminate in that person with the help of the teacher with the help of the teachings of quran it's almost like uh, for example, the, the general sessions that are there about moral teachings is like when doctors, they appear on TV and they talk, they, they give general tips about health. Like, for example, a doctor comes on TV and says, OK, you should cut up uh, uh, on, on your uh, use of, for example, salt intake of salt, for example, you should uh, use lesser fat, for example. So these are general tips for, for everyone. You should work out more. And then sometimes you see that these general tips are not enough for you you have a complicated situation and you have to go and visit a doctor so that doctor then he gives you a prescription only for you and because he's the expert of the field and sometimes this happens like when the doctor knows you your your medical case is with him and he knows you for years and he is the one that even if you want to go to another doctor he should refer you to another doctor so some of uh, the ulama, the moral teachers, traditionally, especially in Shia seminaries, I don't know of the Sunni semi Islamic seminaries, in Shia seminaries, this tradition exists that generations after generations, they have been trained by uh, previous waferers and they have given them this certificate and they don't give it to everyone among their students. Like they select some of their students to be responsible for this job after them and to give, as I said, particular prescription for certain issues, uh, moral issues, mainly moral and spiritual issues. And they train that person so that uh, he can have that level of morality that is uh, something more than just secular morality, like this thing other. It's, it's way beyond that. Uh, it has... Uh, other aspects as well. So these were the, the areas that we can trace the morality in Islamic tradition. Each of these, they have a course of their own, not only a session or something. So when people talk about morality in Islam, <coughs> uh, they shouldn't uh, like take it lightly that yes, morality in Islam, some, some of the talks that are going on, it's it's the end of it. No, these discussions are related and they have direct effect uh, and consequences in any moral discussion that is taking place in any uh, academic or a scholarly circle. So uh, <clears throat> one intersection or main uh, division, or I don't know how to put it, decisive moment in the Islamic discussions about morality is the source of good and evil and right and wrong. What makes us pass the judgment of something being good and something being bad? So uh, there are people who believe it's a matter of revelation. What revelation, which means Rahir, Quran, the teachings of religion, faith. When, when the faith tells us something that is good, we say it's good. When it says it's bad, we say it's bad. So we have this and we have people who believe, no, it's a matter of reason. and actually it's because reason told us we started searching and we accepted the religion reason told us that we have to thank the creator we have to know the creator otherwise uh, it becomes a circular argument if we want to refer to the same source for the authenticity of the, the same source we have to 
use the authenticity of revelation from reason uh, in order to get rid of that circularity. And among the people who believe in the rational basis for moral judgments, uh, again, there is a, a disagreement or, uh, over whether it is essential, essential in the sense that if there was one person at the first moment of the creation, and uh, for example, <coughs> he, see, he saw something uh, that was morally bad and something that was morally right, for example, stealing, that person would say this is bad this is something essential in the human mind the human mind has been wired to to believe this is bad and to believe this is right this is actually one of the discussions going on even in western philosophy like the uh emmanuel kant he said uh one thing that amazes me there are two things in the world that amazes me amaze me the the stars in the and the the moral faculty in our minds so the the root of this moral faculty so there are muslim uh, theologians and philosophers who believe it is a matter of essential rational judgment some believe no it's social <coughs> which is again there's a division which is an internalization of generations after generations cost and benefit experience of moral acts like generations after generations they saw that a stealing we corrupt the society and we ruin that structure of society that that uh security that we need for example lying will will will, will destroy that social trust that we need uh, uh everything every all moral vices they have a con practical consequence negative consequence in society so after this generation like evolutionists so we developed a negative attitude toward this because we realized that so and it has become so internalized that even if we don't see that consequence we believe that it is bad negative it's because of that internalization process that the, we don't need to see the consequence of a stealing to say it is bad. No, uh, it has now become part of our genes to believe, but it is it was not there from the beginning. It's a matter of, so we have from Muslim philosophers who believe in that uh, explanation about morality, which as I said, is close to evolutionist morality. And then some of them say, no, blame and praise, uh, not cost and benefit, uh, but the fact that we believe something is bad because we take feedback from other people when other people blame something we believe it's bad and when they praise we believe it's good uh, so as you see it's not one thing like for example say islam says this and all muslim scholars even in shia islam which is a minority among all muslims as still we have these divisions these discussions in the seminaries they talk and these uh, principles that they adopt at these levels they have consequences in the fatwa that they give in the opinions that they form in jurisprudence and also in theology and other dis uh, discussions <coughs> then the question is that if morality is rational according to shia islam then what's the role of religion uh, there we have creative legislative they discuss that uh, not always we need religion to tell us everything about uh what we should do sometimes religion gives us general direction sometimes the the commands that are there in religion are advisory ershadiya, meaning that they religion reminds us of what we already had within our intellect this is very important now in uh quran many times you see that uh, quran refers to divine books and the prophets as reminders the concept of forgetfulness of human being uh insan human being even some people the lexical root of the insan they say come from this john forgetfulness so these are the elements of Islamic ideology that you forget. What do you forget? You forget that fitra, that innate moral, a part of it is moral, part of it is theoretical of knowing your, your God and everything. Part of it is moral. So religion does not need to give you 
direct command. Religion sometimes functions as a reminder. So uh, it's, it's enough for, for those discussions that we didn't know that religion gives us new knowledge. For example, we didn't know how many rak'ahs the morning prayer is. Then religion gives us the direction. We didn't know that what is going to happen on the day of judgment. Then religion gives us the knowledge about that. But uh, stealing is bad. Did we need religion to tell us this? No, we already knew it, but we had forgotten it. So religion remind us of this. And the guarantee for the uh, for these moral uh, obligations, what does it mean guarantee? That if you don't do it, then there is a day of judgment. There is a, there is a day in which it's not like <coughs> everyone does everything that he wants. That's a theoretical guarantee of the um, of, of moral values, the theoretical guarantee. Why do I say theoretical? Because it's possible that the person claims to believe in this or knows this, but at the same time fails in uh, complying with the moral values. Uh, there's, a, there's a discussion about the roots that we come, inshallah. I want to, inshallah, finish it earlier, 45 minutes, so that we have more time this session on the questions. And then if there was no question, we could come back and explain some of the parts that we left here. Uh, expectations of from revelation or religion, this is very important. Every discussion, almost every discussion nowadays, like between science and religion, between the laws that should we follow the laws of religion in the modern world, as if like we are now living in a different era that is completely different from previous era. Those who try to make it seem that modern world is so much different from the past, that things of the past are, are of no relevance to the, the modern world, uh, in a way they are denying the khatamiyya of Islam, that the religion of Islam is enough for all time. Uh, sometimes some people do that. Sometimes they try to, to uh, portray such a contrast between modern time and the time, for example, in which Islam was immersed, uh, that you automatically believe that religion was for the past. And for this for this era, we don't have a time. We don't have a religion. We don't have a guide. We don't know what to do, which is completely right. That there are differences is correct. At the time of the prophet, there were differences from the previous prophets, like the way there have been differences throughout history. Yes, nobody claims that everything is the same. But to claim that the character and the identity and the essence of the time has changed, uh, makes it impossible for the religion of Islam to function in this era. And some people, they had this in mind, which is wrong. So we have to first uh, understand the expectations from religion. What do we expect from a religion? Now, there's one misunderstanding about the role of religion, both in practical reason and theoretical reason. That misunderstanding is that whenever we didn't understand anything, we use religion to explain it. God of the gaps. God of the gaps in theoretical reason. We don't know how the moon moves or not move. We say, okay, it is God moving him as if God has a hand and then he plays with the moon. And then when we scientifically discover that, no, there's something called gravity and we say, okay, religion failed. From the beginning, you had the wrong expectation. Religion didn't come to tell you this. It was not the job of religion to fill the gap in science. So it was the misfunction. It, it was the, the, the misunderstanding that you had, that you thought this. And later on, when it was discovered, you said, OK, God of the gaps have filled <coughs> or has filled. The true source or, or function of religion, according to Islamic teachings, uh, especially there is a line Imam Ali alayhi salam talks about in Nahj al-Balagha, uh, is to, uh, let us arrive at that after this. First is creating the means to fulfill, to fulfill rational obligations. What does it mean? There's a line that Muslim uh, theologians, Allama Halli, they say, al-wajibat al-sam'iyya, al-tafan fil wajibat al-aghliya. What does it mean? It means put aside religion, everything, now, when I use my own reason, Quran says, 
those who look at the earth and the heaven and look at themselves and they say this cannot be in vain the whole difference between religions and non-religions or material materialistic worldviews is this that like it doesn't matter christianity islam judaism they believe that there is a there's a point in all of this there's a point in all of this but then i mean those who don't believe in a personal god for them there is no point in that it's a result of accident and it's it is going to be nothing after that so it's just a matter of uh some accidents happening and uh, then there is no meaning in life there is no purpose in life there's no purpose of human history so the main thing is that purposefulness when you look at the earth and the sun and everything and then you realize that there's a purpose then you the next level the next step is that you realize that there's a god there's there's an agent there's someone who had created this but you don't know how to communicate with this god if we didn't have religions we didn't know how to communicate with this god like people who believed in superstitions they they thought that for example the thunder is their god or clouds are their god they would start acting weirdly like when they thought this is a way that they can communicate to god which is not then religion helps us create and establish this communication through the way that that side of the connection understands not, doesn't mean if we don't follow it he doesn't understand no in a way that it is officially accepted let's say let's put it this way like the prayer is like every every time like for example you want to see the boss of some somewhere or a, a person that you don't know there are protocols that you have to follow right in order to have a standard way of communication and not having misunderstanding so uh religion is like that it gives you an explanation about this god and how you can have official communication to him and how you can have your personal way of talking always praying in your own language your your difficulties everything so this is one role of religion main role of religion that once you had reached that level with your own mind that there should be something going on if you didn't have revelation you were in perplexity for the rest of human history i mean we all will be in perplexity those searching minds would not just remain uh, quiet when they see everything and they they don't have an answer to this question so there is a need from that other side to start the communication completion of moral or rational values that <clears throat> for sure it, killing is bad ch charity is good but to what extent charity is good to sacrificing yourself if if there was no hereafter your reason would tell you sacrificing yourself does not make sense because uh, you are giving up everything for what? If you don't exist, you're not going to even enjoy this uh, moral virtue that you have. So then the, the, the belief in the hereafter, the belief in the, the continuation of human perfection, whatever we do, we do it for our perfection. Uh, it's impossible for an rational agent to do something uh which does not have any perfection from at least he thinks that it is what perfection lies like either in pleasure or anything he should establish it with itself that this is my perfection and he goes and seeks it so if you don't believe in that hereafter if you don't believe in that point in the whole creation then moral virtues could not reach that high level of uh when they arrive after having that picture of uh, creation correction sometimes some people they have practices like you usually for example they <coughs> uh the reba there was a practice that they could use usually here and there and uh, it was so common that they had either forgotten or it has become a custom among some people then religion says no this is bad remind them of how bad it is or for example at the time that islam emerged in the arabian peninsula it was a custom to kill children mainly female children infants because of the 
either the embarrassment they believe it brings to their tribe or sometimes poverty, then Islam says, no, you should not do that. This is wrong. So correction and theoretical guarantee that we talked about, belief in the hereafter, that, for example, when you see people who are oppressive, who killed millions of people, and then they just die, they don't receive any judgment. And uh, you would have that question. This is the question. Is it possible like everything finishes like that? Then he kills everyone else. Uh, he doesn't receive any judgment. There is no guarantee for morality. If you see that, you say, OK, this is the world in which you can do everything almost and get away with it. Why should I follow morality? Why should I follow moral values? Then the theoretical guarantee comes. No, there is a day that these people should be responsible and you should be responsible. Setting some dis settling some disputes, by its final say, like they give the example of earth heritage, <coughs> in inheritance. It's a better word, inheritance. Like the properties of a dead person. Always in different cultures, there are fights over who should get how much of it. And uh, even if a person is allowed to to dismiss or to deprive one person completely from this or not, then Islam says, okay, there is a structure. Everyone follow this structure and settle that dispute so that if, if it is up to people, sometimes they go into fights that will never end. So religion, sometimes this is particular issues. Settle these disputes uh, by uh, uh, by defining certain rights and obligations. Like, for example, in a, a marriage contract, the, based on the structure and the picture that Islam has of a family. So Islam has some uh has defined some some rights and obligations of each side uh, in order for some disputes to be settled and we should be careful some of the things that we do are not islamic i should remind this some of the things many people believe are islamic are the results of their own culture and because most people don't refer to the sources they they think whatever the elders do it is islamic and whatever the young do is not islamic it's not the case uh, uh especially in the case of marriage or even the funerals, uh, unfortunately, we have these issues. So uh, we have at this section, we have verses of Quran talking about the expectations from Revelation. Let me just go to the end of the, uh, we didn't get time to, to follow this, root of all moral vices in Islam. This is very important. This is very important uh, because the practical uh, tip that the brother asked last session, how we can uh, get rid of some of the moral vices or issues that we have, the bad habits. <coughs> so if there's a problem, we cannot solve it without knowing its root. It's like a person having fever. And then I say, OK, I, I can't I can't cure you. And I start giving him different medicines and I, I have not. Uh, given I have not taken a diagnosis of what is going on, maybe the fever is the result of infection or the result of, I don't know, a simple headache. Or So there might be different reasons for this. This is just a symptom. So when you have a moral issue, like, for example, a person is aggressive in in conversation, in talks, he, he gets angry easily. Uh, in Arabic, they call hedda. Hedda means a person who jumps into a... Uh, angry like either comments or behavior easily uh so you see okay that person has this or a person has another bad habit like for example there's a sin that he cannot get rid of continuously doing it for example committing it uh backbiting for example or many other things so it's wrong to believe that all moral voices they have the same root sometimes this is uh, true. Let me finish this now. And if you had question, we, we come back here. Uh, sometimes some people who have shallow and superficial understanding of religion, they think they can cure all problems with faith, for example. Uh, this, is, this story is famous. It happened in Rome while we were in Hausa. Uh, one of the ulama that I don't want to mention his name, is almost famous, very famous in Rome, but maybe in other communities, uh, not all people know him, but he's a respected scholar. So uh, a young man went to that scholar and said, okay, Maulana, Sheikhna, Ayatollah, 
I have a serious issue. What's the issue? The issue is that when I go to morning sessions for Abu Abdullah, no matter how much I try, tears don't come out of my eyes. And I cannot cry. And it makes me nervous that uh, maybe I did something wrong. And I've been punished. I'm being punished by this, that I have been deprived of this blessing. So generally, there is a line of hadith that if that person, young person, had referred to me, I had given him this line of hadith. The line of hadith says, dumo, the tears will not be dried unless the heart is hardened. And the heart is not hardened unless the person has committed a lot of sin, so he, has, he needs to repent. If that person has referred to me, I would have told him, told him, yes, my brother, it's a matter of committing sins and you have to refrain from sins and it's the result of your sins. But that the scholar said what? Said, okay, you see, there's a problem with the eyes. And there's a doctor that I know, you refer to that doctor, there's an eye drop he gives you in the prescription that I drop, you get it from the pharmacy, you use it, and then you go to morning session and you can cry. And the person did it and it worked. And it, it appeared that it was only the physical problem there. It was not spiritual issues. Another, another story I have related. But some people are like, they, they're easily jumping to one, one solution for all that they have. And that solution for all that they have is the easiest solution. Like, for example, if you have this problem, it's a lack of faith. You don't believe in God. Or, for example, you, uh, you committed a sin or something like that. This might not be right. And if it is right, <coughs> this might not be as simple as this. Like, for example, you say you're suffering from lack of faith. And just by telling this, you're actually increasing his faith. No, actually, you're maybe you're creating other problems. So the most important thing is that when the person says, OK, what is the practical tip in order to have a solution for these moral issues is to find out the root of this. Sometimes it's bad companionship, bad friends, bad the circle of bad wrong people that this person is caught up among. Or for example, uh, sometimes yes, it's a matter of faith, but not the faith that you think is there. Like for example, excessive repetition of certain vec without thinking, for example, or excessive uh, practicing certain things that without without having any actual result from it. Yes, for for one of the main reasons that are discussed in <coughs> in traditional, as I said, wafering, they say lack and weakness of tawhid is the root of all moral vices. It's right. It's true that lack of tawhid, the true concept in oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is one ultimate agent in the whole universe. For example, if you feel jealous, jealousy is the root of, of many moral vices. Many toxic comments that we make is rooted or rooted in jealousy, but we don't know it. So, uh, like subconsciously, we start hating a person. We start making toxic negative comments either in his presence or in his absence because we feel jealous, but we don't know. So jealousy is the root of, like, if you can cure jealousy, you, you can al almost cure many, many other, other things. So if a person feels jealous, it is because the ulama say, they say it's because he doesn't believe that Allah is the one who divides the rest, sustenance and blessings among people. If I believe that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision for me to have this much and for my brother, for my friend to have that much, would I feel jealous? No. If I trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his decision, would I feel jealous? No. It's either that I don't know this, or I don't trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or I don't believe in this. There's a distinction between knowledge and belief. The example that they say is what? For example, you know, scientifically proven to you with all the things that you, you actually believe in their methodology, it has been proven to you that a dead person does nothing to you. A dead body corpus does not does nothing to you. It's it's like harmless, like a dead meat over there. So you know this. You're certain about this, one hundred percent. But then, if I tell you, okay, go and sleep with that dead body in a room for a night, many people would refuse. Why? Because they know, but they don't believe it. 
they think that no, maybe at the middle of the night, it stands off and does something. So this is the, sometimes we know that Allah is the Razzaq, the, the one who gives rizq to people. Allah is the one yapsutur rizq alleman yashawiyadir. He is the one opening up the rizq or closing, closing the rizq of people. But we don't believe in it. And that's why we have issues like jealousy. We have issues. So they say one of the things is the lack of faith. Yes, lack of faith is a problem. But not that faith that we believe in, like practicing blindly, like a parrot repeating something. If you is are under the training of a, a scholar, a person who is expert in the in this regard, yes, with, with that ma'rifa, with that knowledge, uh, we can... Uh, get better in correcting ourselves. Sorry, this is the time for questions and answers. Okay, uh, if there are any, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikh, for that uh, enlightening talk. Yes, indeed. Uh, it is time now for the uh, question and answer session. Uh, so for the viewers who are watching, you make sure to send in your questions down before we uh, finish the timing for today's webinar. The few questions that I have, uh, inshallah, Sheikh, the first one is, uh, what are the Islamic views on equality, justice, fairness, and brotherhood, uh, and freedom of choice uh, based on morality? Um, uh, thank you, very good question. We didn't get the slides that I went through rapidly. We didn't get time to cover them. All of these are discussed in different uh, Islamic teachings, especially in Shia, Alhamdulillah, we have, I think, richer uh, heritage on that. Like <clears throat> the line from Nahjul Balagha that Imam Ali says, which is at that time, Nowadays, it has become a common discourse. But at that time, when Imam Ali says, the creation of God are either your brother in religion or equal in creation. It's a principle. Or the golden rule. For others, treat others like the way you want to be treated. And it is others. Some ulama, they say this other also include animals. So for others means not just believers muslims or, or no others any anyone anything that's why we see in the practice of our ulama like allama tawatawai and our ulama who were trained in this you see they uh, they wouldn't even kill an ant or a fly they would open the door for him to go not killing him so they were based on this teachings of golden uh, rule that is known as a golden rule in, in and then the talk about equality and justice, we all know justice does not mean equality in the sense of giving everyone, like for example, if there's a child here, here, I give him the same clothes that I give you as an adult. So the child will be upset. It's not, it's not just to make him upset because I want to give him equal share. Uh, so uh, yes, we have a lot of things to say about this in, in Islam. Fairness and insaf which is a level before we have a, we have a, a hadith that says fairness and saf is the easiest in talk, the, the most difficult in practice. And it is right. If you, if you become a, a responsible for division, for example, it's very difficult to, to divide things equally and to treat yourself as others. Uh, but inshallah, if we have another session, we should talk about this more extensively. Asanta, uh, thank you for that uh, answer. And of course, you know, uh, morality uh, uh, includes kindness and uh, forgiveness and charity, etc. Uh, how can one uh, practice these sorts of elements uh, of morality? Um, uh, so we talked about this idea of having belief, correct belief, and on this. Like, for example, even in Quran, says, Wa ahsan kama ahsan Allah like. Remember how God uh, did ahsan. Ahsan means act of kindness. He brought you into existence. He put you in a family and then he supported you through the means that you didn't even realize. Ahsan kama ahsan Allah. Like you also should do ahsan to others, do kindness to others. So this is one way of when you make yourself as somebody dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the problems that we have is that because we, we see ourselves in dealing with people and we get upset because we don't get the proper response. When, when you show love to people, uh, sometimes it's possible that you, you don't receive back the love that you show to them and you, you become like disappointed. But Quran says, no, ahsan kama ahsan Allah. As you see, God is giving even to those people who don't respect him, who don't even believe in him, but he does ahsan to them. 
So uh, this is one thing that we are dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this, in all of this. It's not Mr. X or Mrs. That that I'm dealing with. It is Allah. I'm doing this. I'm showing love to people. I'm saying so I respect them because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of the issues that we have in our families could be solved if we see ourselves in, in dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not with people. Hassan, so the final question, inshallah, before the end of our uh, webinar is that, of course, you know, all religions, uh, they teach good and they teach uh, kindness. Uh, so what are the reasons uh, for people uh, doing committing acts of sin or uh, committing acts of violence or bad acts? So what, what is the reason behind that? Um, uh, yes, uh, inshallah, in the next session, we should go through those uh, roots of vices, uh, heedlessness, ghafla, forgetfulness, uh, forgetting the day of judgment, becoming a bad habit. Sometimes it becomes a part of the personality of a person to be bad. No one is born evil and no one turns into evil acts through a night. It, it happens in a gradual process. It happens in a gradual process where people forget about uh, those moral values that they had in themselves until the time that they lose the moral compass that they have. Quran says this, that some people, they commit so much sin that they don't even see right as right and wrong as wrong, which is very bad. Sometimes I commit a sin, but I know it's a sin. And I, I know it's a bad thing that I'm doing. But sometimes I get so much involved in this filth that I forget what was sin, what was not sin, and I lose my compass. So uh, religions, they teach good, but <coughs> that purification that Quran talks about, tazkiyah, doesn't take place for everyone, doesn't take place with information, doesn't take place with initial belief in something. Purification is a process that needs attention and that needs uh, a guide uh, for, 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 for it to take place correctly. And inshallah, we talk about that uh, more as well, inshallah. Uh, thank you so much for enlightening us on today's talk, uh, dear Sheikh, and of course, answering the questions that the uh, viewers uh, had sent, inshallah. I hope uh, to see you again very soon. A final reminder uh, to the viewers that this is a recurring webinar every Monday uh, at 6 p.m. UK time, inshallah, on YouTube, on Awake TV and also here on Zoom as well. You can participate with your questions and answers uh, throughout these uh, few weeks of webinars. Uh, we will be joined by esteemed scholars and also learned guests, uh, specialists, uh, you can call them, uh, that will delve into their own subtopic, of course, relating to the main topic of Islam and contemporary issues. Uh, so thank you again for joining me today. Uh, so for me, the moderator, Sayyid Mahdi Abidi, and our dear guests here, who joined us from Iran, Sheikh Hussein Latifi. I bid you farewell, dear viewers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.